I've had 29 different instruments. Eight Strads, eight Del Jesus, Guarneri's, Bergonzi's, Amati's, the finest instruments in existence, the finest ones I could find. I've never heard a better combination of instruments out of all of those than the ones that went into this recording. It's by far the best. Well, this beautiful violin that I have the great fortune of playing on is the 1715 Baron Knoop ex Bavon Strad. This sits firmly in Stradivarius's golden period, the period which many consider his best instruments to come during his lifetime. This instrument was said to be his favorite to play, and I, I immediately, the first time I played it, I could see why. It's a very easily approachable instrument. Unlike a lot of the other great strads of the golden period, this one doesn't require as much effort to get a deep sound out of. This instrument is incredibly even from top to bottom. A lot of why these instruments are as great as they are is sometimes you just cannot tell when someone's playing on the E string or the A string. And this instrument, you can go up from top to bottom and not tell. It made it incredibly wonderful to play the Schubert on. Obviously, because so much of Schubert is, is vocal material, it's singing material, especially in the first violin. I instantly fell in love with this instrument, and the love just grew deeper as the time went on. When the Baron Knoop violin came to the United States in 1927, the Hills suggested it should be called the Baron Knoop, and it's had that name ever since. Now, there are a number of other instruments with his name on them, but this is the most famous one. It was played by Heifetz for a couple of years, early in his career in the 30s. It's a wonderful, sunny, delightful, happy-sounding fiddle. It's a great violin. This is the 1698 Pietro Guarneri from Mantua. When we first walked into David's house, he had uh, laid out several instruments. I played each one of them, and I picked this one up, and I stand by my words in that moment. I said to David, I said, this is the greatest second violin in the world. And uh, it has proven to be a great partner in crime for this whole Schubert experience this week. It has a phenomenal ability as a second violinist. What I spend a lot of time doing is connecting the sound of the first violin, which is often in these very bright registers, to the sound of the lower half of the quartet, the viola and the cello. And in combination with John's instrument, this violin has a ring that enables it to both reach those upper partials and bright sounds of the violin as well as connect into the lower spin of the, the lower instruments. And I have to say it makes my life so much easier having to play this. It gives me a freedom, it gives me a creativity which allows my mind to then focus on an artistic level which normally it's involved in having to choose sides of giving more to our first violin or more to the lower half, and with this violin, it actually takes care of all of those problems for me. So it's a great, a great, very close friend. Um, and in combination with this tort bow, which I've also been very much enjoying, uh, it pulls out these colors and sounds, which gives the blend of the quartet, I think, uh, a much richer, but clearer and uh, more finessed sound. We've been trying to figure out how to describe the difference in playing these instruments versus play, playing on our own. And, and one of the easiest ways that's come to my mind is, is on our own instruments, we often spend you know, 70, 80, sometimes 85% of our energy focused on getting the instrument to provide the sound that we're looking for. And that leaves 15, 20% left for artistic creativity. But when you put these great instruments in a set like we've had for this recording, and also in our hands, that ratio really flips. And so because the instrument is guiding you and showing you and inspiring you with the sound it provides, really you're spending maybe 10 or 15% on focusing and grabbing the sound that you want. And that leaves open 80 to 90% for creativity, which is just a phenomenal experience for everyone. Peter of Mantua was the son of Andreas Guarneri. He was a black sheep in his family. He's the guy that went off to Mantua and he stopped making violins except for a few very special customers. And what he did was he ran the music program at the Ducal Court in Mantua. So he became a musician, very fine violinist, I imagine. At any rate, he made only very few instruments and the ones he made were pretty fancy. They're decorated, they have fleur-de-lis on them, sometimes in the corner inlays. They're beautiful, beautiful instruments. Peter Mantua's production was very small. We only know of about 46 instruments altogether that are in existence that he made. 
I wish he'd kept on making them. He was a wonderful maker, but he didn't. This is the great base of Spain Stradivari from 1713. We all think about Stradivarius and his violins, but I think his greatest triumph uh, was the Forma B, the, the golden period cellos. And there are very few great ones. And I've actually had the great fortune of um, being able to play quite a number of them. And the thing that immediately struck me about this cello in particular is that I've spent my whole life looking for an instrument that I felt spoke with my voice, a voice that felt natural to me, a voice from top to bottom that, that actually felt like my own. I've always had complaints about instruments, even some of the great instruments, the great name Strads or Montagnanas, but this cello is pretty much perfect. I can put the bow to the string and it speaks the way I want it to speak always. I never have to worry about it. And it speaks in a, in a voice and in a, in a tone and in a color that feels so natural to me. Whereas with other instruments, I feel like I'm always pushing them to find that voice. I think we all had similar experiences when we first played these instruments. The first time I played, my eyes kind of welled up with tears and sort of feels like finally as a musician, I, I, I'm complete in a way. And so recording the, this G major quartet with this cello, this incredible, incredible thing, has been a real honor, a real moving experience, and one that I will never forget. I'm grateful to be sitting with it now. It's really, really extraordinary. The cello itself also has an amazing history and story about how it was, was found. The top and the back were split up and you know, the stuff of great films. There's an amazing piece of history right here, but also a tool that speaks in a way that no other one does. It's humbling. I don't know if the bass of Spain is the best cello in the world. It's the best sounding cello I've ever personally heard. It's a very great thing and very beautiful. When I had a lot of cellos, and I had some wonderful, wonderful cellos, I had the best of the Guarneri cellos, I had a great Montagnana cello, I found there was a certain order you had to play them. The cellist would come, take out the Montagnana, he'd play it and he'd say, wow, this is fabulous, this is the best cello I've ever heard. And then you'd take out the Guarneri cello and the windows would rattle and the floor would shake and the cellist would say, this has got to be the greatest cello on the planet. Then the bass of Spain would come out and nothing else was touched again. The voice of God had entered the room. The bass of Spain probably has the most celebrated history of any cello. It goes all the way back to the fact that the top was separated from the back. It was recovered out of the store window of a maker. It was walked by Tarisio on foot from Madrid to Paris. It's pretty amazing. That It's an incredible, incredible instrument. This is a viola by Andreas Guarneri, and it's very rare. It's one of only five or six violas in the world made by this maker. It's a beautiful sounding instrument that actually is a little bit on the small side compared to most violas in the last 400 years. It was made in 1676. And that makes it very easy to play, easy for your left hand to get around the instrument. One thing that's very interesting about this instrument is a lot of the work apparently on this instrument was done by Andreas's son, Peter of Mantua, who also worked on the violin that Will is playing as the second violin in the quartet. So I find that this viola, besides being a wonderful instrument and a very beautiful instrument, uh, also has a particular affinity for the violin I'm trying to play with across the quartet, mostly when I'm playing string quartets, the second violin. And that created an identity of the inner voices, second violin and viola together, which I think made it much more easy and actually startlingly refreshing to play with when we were making this recording. This bow also is quite rare. It's by Francois Tort, and it's one of only five viola bows in existence that Tort ever made. So to be able to put these two things together, it's sort of the double whammy ultimate combo uh, of violas, which it's hard to find good violas that are well preserved and that play well from this period by any maker. So it's been very rewarding and actually quite a discovery for me to have a chance to play this very throaty, contralto sounding viola. There are only five or six known Guarneri violas. This one's by far the best in terms of preservation and in my humble opinion also in terms of sound. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. 
It had been used for chamber music in chamber music groups that included King George IV of England. It's been a famous instrument all of its existence. Its history can be traced back extraordinarily far, back to the 1700s. Unusually, it has the original neck. It's perfect in every way.